All right, man, all the ads on this have been like really super cool. I get totally- I know, right? (laughs) I I had never looked closely at that that logo and I was like, oh my God, that's like a cool hot cyberpunk. It's really cool. That's pretty slick. (laughs) <laughs> Last night on the um, the as the finalist or not the finalist one, but the the talk about contests, um, they had one for the Anatomy of Fear anthology, and I was I was spellbound. It was, <laughs> it was really good. All right, that one so was really fun. To let me introduce okay. us. Yeah. We're already chatting, so that should give you guys an idea of what this is going to be like. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> Welcome to the first live Swords and um, Swords and Corsets podcast. Uh, if you're not familiar with us yet, we're Carissa, Crystal, Jen, that's me, um, and Angela Board, who is with us in spirit today. We love you, Angela. <laughs> um, and we talk all things fantasy romance. Um, so we'll just do a quick little intro of ourselves and what we write, and then we'll kind of go into the topic. So let's we'll start with Carissa. Hi, um, I write romantasy like all of us. Um, <laughs> I am best known for writing uh, the War of Lost Hearts trilogy, Daughter of No Worlds, and for the Crowns of Nyaxia series, which was my current ongoing series, uh, starting with The Serpent in the Wings of Night. And I am currently very heads down working on some very intense deadlines on those. <laughs> so that's me. And I'll punt it to Crystal. Uh, hi, I write uh also romantic i i gotta get better at this it's right there legacy of the bright watch was a <laughs> fifth bow finalist last year um it's romantic but it leans harder into um kind of grimdark vibes and um um there's the the hea is going to be at the end of the series rather than any particular book so it, it's a book it's a series that will reward romantic patience <laughs> and i'm also like romantic patience back, like yeah <laughs> <laughs> backed up against a really unforgiving deadline working on Legacy of Brick and Bone that's coming in April. Crystal and I whine to each other literally every day. Constantly. We have like a sprint room and we just like cry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to do it. Having company in the whining makes it easier to then get work done. It does. You it normalizes are, our suffering. You guys are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So I'm... Jen, I write under J.D. Evans, and I'm currently in the middle of my debut series, the first book of which is this one, which you probably won an award, seen. right? Yeah. It did. It won an award. It's a little award. <laughs> um, it won SPFBO seven um, against Crystal somehow, <laughs> and I don't. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I write. Um, I write kind of pure fantasy romance so it's the plots really in the romance and the fantasy is the trappings all around it um and that's kind of what we're going to talk about today is how each one of us um approaches writing romance into our fantasy worlds and um how we use it to further the plot and that sort of thing so i think we'll start off with Um, just in case you're new to the subject, Carissa, why don't you define what we mean when we talk about fantasy romance, romanticy, romantic fantasy? Totally. Yeah. And my fear was that as soon as you cued me in, I was going to be like, romanticy, what's that? But (laughs) I've never (laughs) heard of it. (laughs) Good question. (laughs) I'm glad you asked me in particular that question. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So when we talk about romanticy, we're generally talking about fantasy books and fantasy stories in which the romance is pretty inextricable from the story itself. So there are many different subflavors of romanticy, romantic fantasy, fantasy romance. We talk more about that on episode one One, one of our podcast, I believe. All these different subflavors, but in general, we're talking about stories where if you were to like remove the romance from the story, something would very majorly fundamentally change about it. It's like not necessarily that the romance is the only plot. Some of these stories, like my trilogy, like Crystal's books, have a romance that goes over many books, but the romance is a very core piece of it. And to put it like simply, the I know it when I see it factor is like, if you're writing a romanticy, you're writing it because you want to write romance, because you want to write that love story. Um, so in general, yeah, 
fantasy with lots of kissing in it, lots of romance. And in particular, we are going to zoom in a little bit on sex in romanticy because there's kind of this weird dichotomy where like for a long time it was like sex and fantasy is like gross that's like girly stuff or it was like very like like rapey sex you know like that kind of thing and then sometimes you see it at the extreme opposite level where people conflate romanticy and sex completely and really there's like just massive spectrum between those two extremes and we're going to talk a bit about how we each deal with that individually yeah so um you know just kind of to expand on what chris already said i often see you know i kind of hang out all of us hang out in the fantasy and the romanticy sometimes the romance spaces and there are there are differences in that spectrum that get mislabeled and like she said conflated so erotica is very much its own thing and yeah. um, that, when you say erotica, what you're talking about is a book where the sex is the plot. That's the plot. It may not have an HEA. It may not end in the way a romance ends that, you know, the plot is these people having sex. That's erotica. And then you use smut. And I was thinking about this the other day. I think smut is, do you guys, did you watch Zootopia? Do you remember that part where the bunny's like, oh, see, a bunny can call another bunny cute. But if you're not a bunny, you shouldn't call me cute. And that's kind of what smut is. Like within the romance community, we use it like as a tag of honor, right? Yeah. But um, but outside of it, it's often used derogatorily. So keep some of those things in mind as we go forward here. Um, and I'm just going to touch very quickly on the word clean. It's a little bit... Um, device uh, controversial yeah because yeah. um those of us that do write open door often feel like clean suggests that we're somehow dirty um for writing that um and it doesn't necessarily you know it can mean a broad range of things it can mean there's kissing or it can mean there's absolutely nothing or it can mean there's closed door scenes so but generally when you say clean you're talking about something that has little to no cursing little to no pda that kind of thing. So fantasy romance covers that whole spectrum. It goes from, I, I'd, I'd argue that it's not erotica, but it can go close all the way to clean, typically your YA fantasy romance. So with that kind of out of the way, um, you will, we'll start with Crystal, I think this time talking about how you use romance and sex or not sex when you're crafting your plots and arcs. I think it's it's also worth saying before I jump in that we all are kind of in a similar um, middle ground. Neither of us are at either extreme and we all do open door. So this perspective is entirely like the three of us kind of agree with approximately where we are in the spectrum and it shifts a bit, but not that much. So um that being said, romance was um, something that I decided to add in later in the process of uh, working on Brightwash. Um, very early drafts of it were so dark and so bleak that um, I got to a point where I didn't enjoy working on it anymore. <laughs> like, just a just, little dark. A little bit. <laughs> just, just a lot darker than it is. <laughs> um, and so, like, I just... I, I didn't enjoy working on it anymore. And um, I, I like reading romance. I like it um, in all, all forms. I like just straight romance books. I like, you know, this messy middle ground that we're at. And so I was like, why, why not? Um, what, what exactly is stopping me, which is a whole other rant. But um, so I just pulled some of the darkness out by giving focus on the main character's um, kind of falling for each other and navigating the weird um, power dynamic between them. Um, and it gave the story a lot more hope than it ever had before. And I feel like as I was doing it, it felt so apt because I'm generally of the opinion that the capacity that we have as people to love each other can save us from all the dark 
bleak things <laughs> that we're facing. Um, and so the romance just gave it that spotlight of there's something worth fighting for. Um, and it just, it just came so naturally once I let it happen instead of trying to hide that very, uh, <laughs> what's the word I'm looking for? Sappy and, <laughs> um, general feeling of hope. <laughs> And I'm not sure why hope feels like something I, I have to admit that I have, but there it is. <laughs> Maybe because I'm yeah, a great writer. Something for your therapist to answer. We can't talk about yeah. that here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, All right. Um, and so in, go ahead. You're going to tell me. No, I, the pause was long. So I was like, oh, maybe she's done, but keep going. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, when it came to then writing the inevitable sex, um, I noticed myself at first, I was kind of really vague and euphemistic and kind of distant from it um, in a way that didn't fit the tone of the writing at all just because um the violence is then described in pretty flinching or unflinching detail that um so then when it came to writing these you know really light and poetic sex scenes where nothing is named it just it just felt so weird like it felt like i was writing for a completely different book and so that was how i decided that the open door sex just fit the tone of the whole story where we're facing everything together. Hi, Kelsifer. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> Our fourth member has arrived. <laughs> yes. Only Very only <laughs> it's always the butt. Why is it always the butt? <laughs> He's like, just look at it, guys. Look at it. <laughs> so I am going to interject one thing that I always think about when people talk about the sex and violence in the book. And one is that I firmly believe, as Crystal discovered when she was writing, that your yeah. violence and your sex should match. If you have, yeah. um, if you're in a romance book, okay, you don't have to write, you don't have to write either one of these things into your book. But um, if you're going to have an open door scene, it needs to both fill the promise you've made. What kind of tension are you already writing? And then if you are writing really graphic, gory death and violence, you may want to consider yeah. stepping up your gory smooches. Smooches. <laughs> <laughs> gory smooches. I love gory, it. Which is probably what they also, are in Crystal's book. <laughs> yeah. I was also thinking that Inevitable Sex is a great like rom-com, like kind of steamy rom-com book title. So between that and yeah. Gory Smooches, like we've got a series we're, going We're here. coining some really important terms for the genre. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so that's if, how i ended up with open door just just to match just to match yeah. like it just felt dishonest in a way to you know describe someone's shoulder being dislocated and then go "Ooh, they're smooching it was just like <laughs> I, I had to get over myself <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right um uh, what you got Carissa? Get us. yeah so <laughs> how do i follow gory smooching mm. um so i originally i came from like a, a very different like background where like both jen and crystal kind of even as like readers came from a more like fantasy skewed background i came from like ya fantasy like i was in like the early 2010s boom of like YA fantasy. So my first couple of books, which are no longer available because they are bad, are <laughs> YA fantasy. <laughs> and I really didn't know how to like write romantic relationships at that point. Um, Daughter of No Worlds, which is like, I would say one of my first like decent books. Um, I really wanted to make sure like it, I knew it was going to be a love story. I knew that it was going to be adult. Like I deliberately decided not to make the characters a few years younger so that it was on that YA cusp line. Um, so, and that's kind of how I fell into, I was like, you know, it, this is an adult book, like there's going to be sex in it. At that point I was reading like adult romanticy. Um, 
but it is definitely like if you read my books, you can see me getting more comfortable with writing sex scenes because the one in Daughter of No Worlds is kind of on the lighter side. And then by the time you make it to, you know, like I just finished writing like a 5,000 word like sex scene, you know? Girl. But, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, right. But with that said, okay, here's, I'm going to try to be educational now and be helpful to other other people. Here's... We talk about like a 5,000 word sex. Very few scenes should be 5,000 words just in general. That's like a really long scene, right? Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about like, how do you leverage sex in storytelling? You know, you can write, there are lots of books that just have tons of sex in them because like, that's what we're all about in this book. And that is completely great. Like absolutely zero judgment to those books. But even erotica books usually have some kind of a character arc happening over the course of those sex scenes. like. Things are yeah. changing. Usually like the character is doing some kind of sexual self-discovery or whatever, and things are progressing over the course of those scenes, even if that progression is in erotica, like a sexual nature. My books are not erotica. They are <laughs> very much romance. So I think a lot about, um, sorry, I'm just pulling up notes so I can sound intelligent here. <laughs> um, <laughs> Awesome. I think about how all of my characters' interactions are progressing their relationship. Um, also, by the way, um, I can't remember if we said this already, but please put questions in the chat. Oh, yes. Thank you. I um, meant to and I forgot. Thank you. Yes, we want uh, your questions. So put them in yes. the chat. Yeah. Please. Inspire. We're very rambly today. We have like a very rambly mm -hmm. agenda on. So if, if we're saying mm -hmm. things that don't make sense to you or if you have like clarifying questions, please put them in there and we'd be happy to extrapolate. Um, so, you know, every scene with two characters should progress their relationship in some way. And I, when I was writing Daughter of No Worlds, I struggled with that because a lot of times you get that advice in the context of an external plot, right? Like you should cut a scene if it doesn't progress the plot. You know, we hear that advice a lot mm -hmm. in romance that can be challenging because progressing a character relationship is different than progressing an external plot. Right. right. So like, if I write a scene and like they, you know, walked from point A to point B and fought some monsters, like, damn, that's plot progression. That's great. If I write a scene where two people are hanging out in a garden and they talk about their personal trauma, it's a little bit harder as an author to determine whether that is progression. And I struggled with that at the time. Um, but ultimately what I came to was, is something different in the way that they feel about each other at the end of the scene than at the beginning of the scene. Mm -hmm. And I find that is true with sex also. Usually the sex scenes are showing how something is changing in their relationship. And sometimes that is obvious, like if it's the first time they're having sex, then that's introducing a very new element. Um, sometimes if you have stories where it's like, you know, we're like friends with benefits and then we're slowly also falling in love, the way that those scenes happen are also signaling changes in their relationship. Like the first time they have like emotional sex or like, you know, the first time they have like, you know, I'm writing a couple right now who is very much working out like kind of a power struggle. So have multiple sex scenes in which that's being explored in different ways is something I'm thinking about. So those are just a few ways that have helped me when I'm thinking about how to utilize sex in the context of a story so that it's supporting the story versus just like some you know, candy sprinkles, you're just sprinkling kind of surfacey on top of everything, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely um, kind of jumping off Carissa's point that um, the, uh, the environment, like the internal character monologue within that, that interaction is, is character growth because um, what, <laughs> how they got here and why they're doing it um, can say so much about them. Then in, in, in a way it's hard to get that much punch in almost any other scene because, you know, for example, in Brightwash, the first sex scene in it, um, these people hate each other. Like they, they are not in a good place and them coming together is like a concession to their enemyhood. And then, and then they go apart and do their own things. And I feel like, showing Tajway making really bad decisions in that moment um, said so much. And it's why I fought for that scene when, um, you know, it was questioned whether or not it added anything. I felt like 
yeah, no, him him making this mistake is important. And then when when yeah. later he's with someone he actually cares about, the tone is completely different. Yeah. So to jump off all that stuff, I think I probably well until Chris has written this five that I I would argue that I probably write some of the most detailed sex scenes in our group. <clears throat> However, that's not like an anatomy lesson sex scene because a sex scene also includes the emotional journey of the characters. And a really good sex scene is um, in a romance, okay? And there's a spectrum of these where, um, like Carissa said, if the book is, it's there for the, the titillation and the sex, that's great. Um, in my books, the sex is there to further enhance this internal struggle of the characters through their character arc, right? So when when they engage in sex, it needs to increase, not relieve tension, it needs to increase tension. So, um, you know, typically if you have sex with somebody, not always, to each their own, but if you're thinking about a monogamous relationship, um, when you have sex with somebody, it opens up all kinds of things in your head, in your heart, what's going on. And then if you add in all the fun stuff that you have in fantasy, you know, political alliances, looming war, probably dragons, maybe some angry elves, like you just don't know, right? But then on top of all of that, you also have this, I just slept with somebody I probably should not have. And what am I going to do about it? Or whatever it is, right? Um, so, um, I think a lot of hardcore fantasy readers hear the word romance or romanticy or fantasy romance and think sex has no purpose in the plot. It's just there to titillate. Right. And, um, that can be true. Um, typically though, and, um, I want to be careful here because there's, there's a line and Chris had kind of talked about this before, but. Uh, sorry, my my family's <laughs> leaving the house, so it may be noisy on my end for just a minute. Um, uh, I'll just use old bodice rippers. <clears throat> Bad romance, um, the sex does not advance the plot. And now um, I've actually had, I recently saw a review in one of my groups where they were like, oh, I loved Rain and Ruin, except... I stopped reading when the sex happened because I don't read sex unless it advances the plot. So um, they're looking at it and they're like, this sex does not advance the fantasy plot, you know? Mm. Um, but it does enhance and progress the personal character arc plot. And if you do it really, really well, it also does the fantasy plot. But if you just stick sex in for sex... A lot of times that's when you're going to get that romance has no place in fantasy thing, right? And so like what Crystal was saying, when she has all this violence and this darkness and she wanted to match it with the light part, um, they're equal, right? So in fantasy romance, that equality is really important. If you are um, going to write something with no open door sex, then when you go into the tension and what you're suggesting between the characters, you need to level that off. There can't be a lot of like sparkly pants feelings and then not give that to the character. Right. Um, Third in our rom-com, steamy rom-com series, <laughs> sparkly pants feelings. Sparkly pants. <laughs> um, because you've promised something you have admitted to the existence of crotch area crotch. or whatever right <laughs> so that has to continue so. through um, um and that's that's what you promise the readers right readers go into a book you're like i'm going to give you this this and this throughout these things and then you deliver on those whether it's yeah. open or close or a hallmark kiss at the end with dry lips and semi-closed eyes whatever Whatever you promised, give it at the end, right? So that can include no sex. That's fine. You, you can still write a romance with no sex. That's our point. Um, yeah. The romance, the important part is not the sex. And it it's is the, the emotional... emotional journey of the characters. Yeah. And that emotional journey 
is what romance readers read for. I will fight you on it. I will die on this hill. Yeah. <laughs> they don't read for the sex. It's fun. We like to read sex. It's, you know, whatever. It's a very nice payoff for a really tense, you know, angsty book. But if the tension is written well, you don't need it. It is the emotional journey. Um, if, a, if a person's reading for sex, they're typically going to lean more toward the erotica or the really heavy, dark kind of romance. But in general, your average romance reader, they want that emotional journey. They want the connection. The, they the want and the... the tension, the will they, won't they. Of course, we know they will. We know, but it, it gets us every time. But then so, the moment. Sorry, like, I'm a hand talker. A of... I am not Italian, but I do talk my hands. <laughs> I have <apologize>. too. No <laughs> judgment there. That's why I'm holding a cup of I'm... coffee so that. <laughs> I noticed we but have the... a couple of chat. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, like, the will they, won't they. Um, it it It's the, the payoff of when they do that that you're reading for. It's that moment of, yes, they 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 did it they figured it out they or they've made a mistake and now they got to figure this out too like all of that stuff is like oh yes, yeah this, my so i i'm gonna pop in dan asked dan fitzgerald asked can sex scenes both advance the plot and character while also titillating of course they Gosh, can i hope so i think a great first, example though of yeah i was gonna say first and foremost before titillation comes plot and character the yeah. emotional um in and it's like Chris has said, like if you're skewing all the way to erotica, the arc is that sexual There's discovery, still an arc there, personal though. discovery, whatever yeah. it is. But in romance, the emotional arc that ends in two people who have found a way to be together emotionally or intellectually, that's the important part. So the titillation is like the decoration. On that but the block. same can be said for just about anything we write about, like sure. violence um, and how much yeah. detail we give it. Um, you can apply the same conversation to it, which is why, um, as a conversation, sometimes it bugs me because it's like, yeah, it's we're reading books for enjoyment. It, it's all supposed to be titillation. And so if you're reading um, books that happen to have sex in them, why does that sex then come to a different standard than you know breaking someone's nose and blood gushing everywhere like it, it's a weird right. dichotomy within us as a, um a community where there's there is a, still a lot of stigma of privacy and shame around it when we're elsewhere in the genre mm -hmm. we're ripping bodies <laughs> apart <laughs> right so it's all titillation like the point is right. is that it is it evolving the story um and i say hell yeah and you also have to think about what what makes something titillating like obviously yeah. we want the sex scenes to be like hot right that's yeah. like what gets us those sweet five star reviews on goodreads but what makes something hot like you can write <laughs> i could write some very detailed words about a penis going into a vagina over and over again mm -hmm. in like you know but with zero context like that's not hot yeah. i mean uh, well i'm not here to yuck anyone's yum if you're into that that's great but <laughs> I, what makes it hot in the context of a romance is that build up and that like oh like you know those hints of like what's this guy gonna be like you know when they finally get you know get together like mm -hmm. that power play like that is what makes it titillating. So I would say it's not yeah. an either or. It's like one it's, leads to the other from my yeah, perspective. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a great way to put it. Um, so I will transition to Stephen Richter's question. Um, there is the sex where the reader is waiting for it to happen. How do you know when in the progression of the plot to have the hookup? So um, I'll start by saying that, you know, it kind of depends on whether you're writing something in one book or in several books, mm -hmm. but in general, um, it kind of depends also, on like, are they going to do it and then break up or are they going to do it and then keep progressing? Um, I've heard people a say- A great example is um, Carissa's where her, her sex scenes always hit before things get worse. <laughs> so it, it's like a tension builder. And then when you learn your, um, the writer that you're following, it's also like a flag of, oh no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it is part of the build to 
the end yeah. like climax so it's funny um mark lawrence read rain and ruin and said something that was kind of interesting and he said that the sex scene sort of took the place of the boss battle in my book right so um i'd i'd stretch it a little bit further and say that it's actually ends up being like part of the boss battle because it should introduce more tension into that dark moment right so um you don't want it to happen if you're writing a romance you don't want that get together moment to happen too (laughs) too soon um it's okay dan it's okay it's okay hi buddy (laughs) this is my child (laughs) all right go have fun okay yep um so you don't uh, what happens when you do put that scene in is there is some resolution, even if it's yeah. not permanent. And so if you put it too early, you have absolutely taken the wind out of your sails as far as the tension and the buildup. So I'd argue that unless you have big plans for breakups and stuff, I would not put that before the 50% mark, maybe even the 60% mark in a story. Um, Carissa may have a different, you know, cause Carissa and, um, Crystal, I, f- I literally forgot your name for five seconds. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mom brain. Uh, you know, they write over several books. And so they have to structure theirs slightly differently than I do mine, which is each romance is in one book. So I'm going to transition over to them to talk about when they and how they apply those um, climax <laughs> scenes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so okay, it- we'll do uh, it- Carissa. <laughs> Crystal ran. So, well, I was just going to kind of see if I can find approximately the page count where the first, uh, it's, it's, it's quite early. Um, and so, <laughs> but that's not, but that's not, that, like that's a, not but it's, it's, um, but did it, it introduce more tension on, and yes, problems? Yes. Yes. That's so what it matters. depends on yep. what, yeah, that's what I was trying to, trying to, build to and then I picked up my book and lost my own train of thought but it depends on what the purpose of this this moment is because um the first scene uh, is not a release of tension it's not a promise that was fulfilled it it is um a terrible mistake that these people really have no business <laughs> <laughs> touching each other and so everything that happens after that is like this moment throws like a political landscape off the rails and um because in this moment they were both kind of selfish <laughs> um and so it depends entirely on what this pairing means to the overarching um tension in in your world building and who they are and why they're doing it and all of that and so when we when we talk about a couple that is going to end up together that arc is a lot slower and and kind of you know the the long longing <laughs> but if it's if you're adding sex as like a grenade sorry it's okay if you're adding sex as a grenade you can lob that thing in wherever you want because right. um, it can make things worse <laughs> yeah Yeah. Right, um, less, less yeah. Cat sorry for talking. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. I don't know what the He's hell so is going with this creature. He's so beautiful that it's okay. <laughs> I apologize. Like nobody's children are as disruptive as this cat. It's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> He's like not usually like this. Um, yeah, I I agree. So mine are actually tend to be remarkably consistent. Like I tend to do. Like, I think almost every book I've ever written, it's like at like 70 ish percent. Same. Um, same. And usually there's like, you know, there might be orgasms that happen before that, you know, like sex adjacent things, but like the actual, like, you know, we're like really, really doing this thing. Um, But I've also, I like this question because I have struggled with that question a lot. Like if you look at a lot of my early outlines, it'll be like sex here, question mark, mark. like sex here, maybe, you know? I do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's not until I'm writing it that I can like feel like, okay, this is like, 
like usually it'll be after something really bad happens, but before something worse happens. And I also usually like to have um, their emotional arc culminate in a certain way. Like if there's like a secret that one of them has not been honest about, not all the secrets, because a lot of times there's still lots of secrets. There's still more. Sex. Yeah. And then there's, there's still tension that you're holding on to, but like, like an emotional moment where they're kind of opening up to each other emotionally in the way that they haven't before, either before or after the physical part. Um, but I would say, yeah, like, I think that um, Jen and Crystal have both nailed it in trying to figure out like how it fits in with the the tension of the overall story. Um, and I usually view it as like something that like Jen was saying happens it, near that third act. Um, mine usually tends to happen around the dark moment because then it's like the stakes are higher, you know, like you've admitted that you're like attracted to this person, you've acted on it, you have caught feelings in some way. And now everything is more difficult because of that. Um, yeah. is usually how I approach it. And I don't think, like, um, my series, there's multiple books where the couple is trying to get together. Um, in the case of, like, the War of Lost Hearts series, like, the couple was very much together by the end of the first book, like, emotionally. Um, and then it's, like, all of this crazy external shit that's happening, and they're trying to, like, survive all of that stuff you know through the next two books so it's not like I had to draw out their relationship for three books um in my current series that is less the case but you still have this nice push pull of you know them getting together and then oh my god all this stuff is revealed and then that changes everything and now we have to like work right back up this hill again and it'll probably end up being 70 percent before they get it on again so <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, I had a thought and my mom brain is bad today, you guys. So we only have a few minutes left. So if you have any questions, pop them in the chat now. Um, and as far as what we wanted to cover, that was kind of, that was kind of the main bent was that when you're looking at romance and fantasy, um, you're not looking at, I'm going to add sex in for no reason. That's yeah. not, that's not what it that's is. What Although I doing. think there's still the misconception that that's what it is, that it's um, a bodice ripper plastered onto a fantasy, you know? Um, and even in like really, really pure fantasy romance, like, um, uh, um, gosh, darn it. <laughs> I need a pill I, for this mom brain. I'll, I'll cut in. <laughs> um, but like that, some of the uh, fantasies and, and that are really super popular that I'm going to call like the absolute fantasy romance where it's less 50, 50 and more 75, 25, right? Yeah. Um, 75 romance, 25 fantasy. That's what I meant. Um, there is no sex without plots. And if you are reading a book where the sex is really gratuitous and doesn't, you know, um, really add to the romance plot or the fantasy plot, um, then you're, you're probably reading a bad romance. There are some, just a few. And um, uh, I think that a lot of people have gone into the, the thought of fantasy romance with that bodice ripper thing in the back of their mind. Do you know, it, they're not yeah. really, don't really understand that it is in fact um, a choice, a plot choice and not a, a bad writing technique if that makes sense good awkward silence all right we've got five minutes <laughs> well Does I, was anybody... just gonna say, I was just gonna say that um i don't understand how your sex scenes don't advance um your plot because your magic powers um <laughs> are are a big part of the, yeah, I'm just the saying, fantasy plot, right? right? And magical sex scenes. There's yeah, and there's like fireworks no, happening and shit. Right. Like, well, so, <laughs> so like... um, you know, but that's what I mean is that I think that if you're not a practiced romance reader, you may not be looking for that emotional arc in the romance plot, and you're like, this didn't bring dragons out. It's not advancing the plot, right? I want but to write a book is with sex summons plot. dragons. Holy shit! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be pretty amazing. I also yeah. wanted to. It can also be. It's like a gray area sometimes though. Like for after, of course, after I finished answering the last question, I was thinking about like in the later books of Daughter of 
No Worlds trilogy when like, you know, Max and Tassana are very much together. They still have on-page sex scenes and their yeah. relationship is not, I would say, market like because they're already like in love at that point. But it's like, it's how you are portraying their relationship to the reader and like mm-hmm. giving those warm fuzzies and like making sure that you're showing. So it's sometimes it's a gray area, you know, like it's not like there's rules where we can be like, it has to do, I have so many losses back there. This is like killing yeah. me right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's She's fuzzy. Cat tail. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to take um, the last minute or two here. Unless Crystal, did you have something to add? Nope. That, that, nope. Okay. That was I'm just going to plug our podcast. It is yeah. Swords and Corsets podcast. Usually we have a fourth, Angela Board. Um but life happened to her today, <laughs> a lot of life. And um, and we would love it if you would come. We've got a couple episodes out. We have a couple more we're going to put out yeah. right now. They're audio only, but we're transitioning to video now that Crystal has real internet like the rest of us. And, and a um, nice house. <laughs> yeah. And this is the kind of stuff that we talk about. And yeah. um, we will keep talking about ad nauseum. So please <laughs> come join us. <laughs> as, as We're all see, over social media as Swords and Corsets podcast. You you tell them exactly what it is on Twitter. It's um, at Swords Corsets. I think that's it. All right. Oh, maybe the Adrian would know. <laughs> Adrian, <laughs> please tell us what our Twitter is. <laughs> <laughs> that's how prepared we are today. We're doing great. <laughs> tell us that we're smart and competent in the so comments, good. please. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, that's going to wrap it up for us, I think. Thank you guys so much for coming. Adrian, thank you so much, everybody that puts all this work into this TBR con because it's amazing and it's free. And yes. if you haven't watched any of the, the other panels, go do it because they're it. all fantastic. Yeah. So many amazing authors and um, writing bloggers people and, and bloggers yeah, and all. Everybody. So, yeah. Check them out now. All right. I think that'll be us um yeah have a great one day. minute to spare. oh no weekend. now we're off nope. <laughs> okay